media, whether you're an employer, whether you work in healthcare, whether you're in civil society or academia, I think there's a role for everyone. I agree with everything that Alana said, but I would still just say this, the first small step that everyone can do is to get to know somebody who is not your age. Get to know somebody who is younger or older than you and know them. Get to know them better. Understand what they like, what, you know, what their personal story is, because only then will you be able to understand and see the diversity in all of us, right? So part of dismantling ageism is understand that we all have value and beauty no matter our age, because we each have something that we bring and we can all contribute. Thank you ladies both so much, Alana and Lena. This has absolutely been a while. Ella, it was absolutely fantastic talking to you and it was great to reconnect with Lena as well. Thank you so much and it was lovely to speak with you, Ella, and so nice to connect with you again, Alana. My guests today were Alana Officer, who's leading the WHO's Decade of Healthy Aging, and Nina Walker, Vice President of Health Security at the AARP, formerly known as the American Association of Retired Persons. I'm El Alshamani, and the conversation is back next week. This is the BBC World Service, where Maddie Savage is telling the story of the rise of Sweden's new super rich. It's home to more dollar billionaires in relation to its population size than almost anywhere else on the planet. I'll be meeting people who've made massive fortunes, finding out how they did it and what they spend it on. Super Rich Sweets, Thursday at 8.30 and 19 GMT. Or listen now wherever you get your BBC podcasts. At bbcworldservice.com, the forum. They say you reap what you see. But suppose you reap up to four times more from the same plot of land. That's what happened in countries like Mexico and India in the 20th century. It was called the Green Revolution. But why hasn't this led to the elimination of rural poverty? This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. And welcome to Newsday on the BBC World Service with Victoria Bonhunda and Rob Young. Coming up as the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken heads to the Middle East for yet another diplomatic push to end the war in Gaza, there are tentative hopes that some sort of a deal to release hostages and hold the fighting can be achieved. Also ahead, Ukrainian commanders have admitted they've been forced back by Russian assaults withdrawing from three villages on the eastern front. We look at whether the arrival of more Western military aid can turn the tide in the conflict. India's massive parliamentary election is well underway. Almost one billion people are eligible to vote. We'll hear from some of them about the state of the healthcare across the country. Business and sport too, but first, the latest BBC World News. with the BBC News. The Israeli military says it's stepping up aid deliveries into Gaza in the coming days, as the United Nations warns that Palestinians there are facing catastrophic hunger. The White House says President Biden has again stressed the need for more aid in his latest phone call with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. More from Will Wagner. This phone call between the two leaders comes as the United States steps up its diplomatic efforts at a crucial moment for the Middle East. The US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has departed for Saudi Arabia, the first stop on another diplomatic tour of the region that will also include Jordan and Israel. In Riyadh, Mr. Blinken will be meeting regional officials to discuss a US-led plan that could lead to a six-week cessation of hostilities as well as the release of dozens of hostages still being held by Hamas in Gaza. Our Minister of Spain, Pedro Sanchez, is expected to announce today if he will resign. He's been considering whether to step down after a court opened a corruption investigation into his wife's business dealings. Over the weekend, thousands of Socialist Party supporters held rallies urging Mr. Sanchez to stay in the job. Guy Hedgeco has more details. 
Uncertainty over the Prime Minister's future has kept Spaniards guessing in recent days following Pedro Sanchez's unprecedented announcement. He made it soon after it had emerged that his wife, Begonia Gomez, was under investigation over allegations of influence peddling. Mr. Sanchez and his allies say the case, which has been brought against his wife by a group linked to the far right, is bogus. They also say that it's part of a campaign to weaken him by going after his family. The opposition has accused him of playing a victim as part of a political strategy. However, among Mr. Sanchez's supporters, there is genuine concern that he will step down just five months after forming a new coalition government. The first of three trials linked to an alleged far-right coup plot begins in Germany today. Nine men face terrorism and high treason charges in the city of Stuttgart. We get more details now in this report from Jessica Parker. Suspects in this case have been linked to the so-called Reichsburger movement, a loose, disparate group of people who, broadly speaking, reject the legitimacy of the modern German state. In December 2022, police carried out door raids after investigators unearthed an alleged plot to overthrow the federal government. Today marks the start of the first of three marathon trials against 27 suspects. Nine men are due before judges later in the city of Stuttgart. Hearings involving those accused of being ringleaders, including a man known as Prince Royce, are due to begin in May. This is the world news from the BBC. Cleanup operations have been taking place in the U.S. state of Oklahoma after tornadoes ripped through several towns. The storms killed at least four people, including a young child. Oklahoma's governor, Kevin Stitt, said he was shocked by the scale of the devastation in the town of Sulphur. What I saw downtown, Sulphur, was unbelievable. And we're working on the damage assessment. The federal government will help these people just like that. All this tax revenue, all these businesses in downtown Sulphur just overnight have been wiped out. The White House says President Biden has offered the full support of the federal government. BBC has been told that Scotland's first minister, Hamza Youssef, is considering stepping down. He's been struggling to secure support for his minority government after ending a power-sharing deal with the Scottish Greens last week. Mr Youssef is now facing two confidence votes and needs the backing of at least one member of the opposition to survive. A team of scientists say they're excited by the discovery of a type of porous material that can store greenhouse gases and may one day be able to capture them from the air. A team from four British universities and one in China have constructed molecules that are cage-like, each just two billionths of a meter in size, which can store harmful gases. Football, Paris Saint-Germain have won the top football league in France for the third year in a row. The men's side were confirmed as champions at the second-placed Monaco lost on Sunday. The result means PSG can't be caught at the top of the table, with three games of the season remaining. PSG have dominated French football since being taken over by a Qatari investment fund in 2011. It's their 10th title in 11 years. BBC World News. Thanks very much indeed for that bulletin. Hello, you're with Newsday from the BBC with Victoria Wonder and Rob Young. Thanks very much indeed for joining us today. Coming up this half hour, you will hear stories from Gaza, from Ukraine and from India. Also in business, brief your boy on why the boss of Tesla, Elon Musk, was going to surprise visit to China. And in sport, George Addo won how Paris Saint-Germain won the French Football League for the third year in a row. As always, your comments on uh, any of our stories are always welcome. The number you need for your text and your WhatsApp messages is plus four four seven seven eighty six twenty fifty eighty five. Uh, starting this hour with our coverage of the conflict in Gaza between Israel and Hamas. Efforts are continuing to try to secure a ceasefire that could postpone an Israeli assault on Rafah in southern Gaza. Overnight, Israeli airstrikes on three houses in Rafah killed at least 13 people and wounded many others, according to medics. 
Israel Foreign Minister Israel Katz has said that planned incursion could be suspended if Hamas agrees to release the hostages is still hold. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Saudi Arabia this morning for another round of talks with Arab leaders. For more, we can now speak to Gada Uda, who is a journalist in Rafa. Good morning to you and welcome to Newsday. Give us a sense of the situation, how things are at the moment in Rafa as an Israeli offensive news. Good morning. Uh, last night, uh, Israel army has conducted monthly airstrikes against the Palestinian here who are living in Rafah. You know Rafah uh, now is more than one million and a half people they are living here. Still the airstrike is being continuously conducted every day, every night, and many casualties were reported from these uh, airstrikes. Uh, regarding the situation here, uh, people are uh, waiting for a ceasefire agreement, actually, and they are uh, hoping that this, the last talks between the Israelis and Hamas group will end it with uh, a, a close of a, a ceasefire as soon as possible. Uh, the situation for the displaced people is very tough, very difficult. They are living inside tents. Uh, now the summer is coming and people they cannot uh, hold or cannot bear the, the situation uh, inside tents without any protection uh, the food and water and sanitation and the healthy condition of people here is very difficult mm -hmm. uh, there is a spread of disease epidemics between uh, children babies and kids and i wonder then Gada, what do people in Gaza make of the comments by Palestinian President Mohammed Abbas that the U.S. are the only country that could stop Israel attacking Rafa? Uh, the Palestinians here know uh, the, the Americans, they can find a solution for the Palestinians as they are playing a uh, major role in the talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians and even um, uh, the Americans, they have uh, a good uh, uh, good power here in the Middle East to stop this war between the Israeli and, and, uh, and Hamas. So they are working for the American communities and maybe there is some protest that can uh, in, 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 new as they can do some more pressure on the, the American government to, 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 to continue or to find a ceasefire. We understand the World Central Kitchen has resumed their aid coming into Gaza and also the U.S. has begun construction of the aid pier on the Gazan coast. How are things looking? What do you know about that? It's still the, the first situation here in Gaza, people are finding so much uh, uh, difficulties in reaching food. The work kitchen, like on the ground, they didn't resume its work and people, they are finding so much difficulty to reach food, especially where, where the prices of some essential is very expensive and there is a shortage of money here in, 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 in Gaza. So, and maybe the, the new uh, Martian corridor, they, they can provide the Palestinians, especially in North Gaza, with some uh, food and can make the prices uh, less uh, expensive and they can back normal to their lives before 7th of October. Gada Uja, thank you so much for your time. A journalist in the southern city of Rafa in Gaza. talk now about that other conflict that we do so regularly in the Ukraine where the Ukrainian military say they've been forced to retreat from three villages because of Russian pressure along the front line. This news comes after $61 billion worth of aid from the United States was approved by the American Congress last week. So can additional weapons improve Ukraine's battlefield position? I've been talking to Dr. Liana Fitz, who's the Washington Post fellow Europe at the Council on Foreign Relations and is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University.
the delay had a very direct impact from week to week. Um, she was running low for Ukrainian soldiers and the amount that Ukrainian soldiers could fire in comparison to what Russian soldiers could fire in artillery shells, for example, was just so different that Ukraine really had no chance but to retreat in certain, certain villages and part of certain front lines. And if the supplementary would not have gone through, we would have seen in the summer major Russian breakthroughs from the front lines. So you're saying then that the retreats that have been announced in recent days are directly attributable to the delay there was in the U.S. Congress? Absolutely. I mean, it's very clear, and the U.S. government and the White House are very aware of that, that the delay in the last six months has really deteriorated the battlefield situation and that it will take time until the aid that is now approved can turn the tide for the Ukrainians. So it's not the case, even if those weapons will be rushed and they are already prepared to the battlefield to Ukraine, it will not be the case that Ukraine can immediately turn the tide and advance on Russia. To the contrary, their task now will be to stop those small Russian advances, but that also will take weeks, if not months. Why do you think Ukraine's European allies didn't step in to fill that gap there was in their ammunition supplies, even if they believed it would only be a temporary one? I mean, they quite certainly couldn't step in. So what the members of the European Union have is they have the financial firepower to support Ukraine. But when it comes to the defense industrial base in the European Union, the member states just don't have the capacity to produce that amount of ammunition, of artillery shells. And at the same time, they also have bought enough sort of on the global market. There were a couple of initiatives, for example, by the Czech president to buy ammunition on the global market. But that was also not enough to replace the lack of U.S. support, which is just so big, the military part of that. And the U.S. is just so much stronger when it comes to the defense industrial base that it is really not something that Europeans could quickly replace within six months. Okay, now you said it will take time for the weaponry that the U.S. Congress has approved to make an impact on the front line. How long do you think it might take for Ukraine to get back to, to where it was before the military aid from America stopped flowing? Well, they will certainly need a couple of weeks, if not months. I mean, they're really digging their defenses now. One problem was that they were focusing on their planned counteroffensive last year and therefore have not prepared the kind of deep defense situation that Russia has prepared on their side. So that's what they're working on right now. But even if the aid arrives in the coming months continuously on the battlefield, it will not be enough in 2024 for Ukraine to go into the offensive because Russia still really has still the upper hand when it comes to ammunition and Ukraine has another problem which is manpower so taken together 2024 can really only be a year of defense even with the US aid approved. So it won't mean in any way then an end to this conflict? Well, so most certainly not this year. Perhaps next year, if the support continues, Ukraine can try again to mount a counteroffensive. What they can do this year is really with the long range weapons that have now also been approved by the United States, the attackers, to hit Russia sort of beyond the lines. But there's no end to the war, no kind of victory or defeat for either side imaginable within this year or even the next year will be difficult. Doctor, yeah, that thing's done. Began as one three two at Tottenham to register back to back away wins against Spurs for the first time since 1988, whilst Manchester City were two nil winners at Nottingham Forest. Paris Saint Germain had clinched the Liga title after AS Monaco's away loss to Lyon on Sunday, putting them on 12 league wins in the club's history. Paris Saint Germain who were held to a surprise 3 3 draw against the Hub, meaning they had to rely on second place Monaco not winning to be crowned champions this weekend. Morocco's Aris Bekani secured their place in the CAF Confederations Cup final after US and Alger failed to honor the second leg of the semi-final showdown over the Moroccan's jersey. 
Egyptian giants. Zamalek beats debutants Dreams FC from Ghana, 3 0 in Kumasi to secure their place in the final. And the Egyptian giants actually will face Esperance the Tunis in the CAF Champions League final. In the NBA, the LA Clippers held up an epic fight back from the Dallas Map to win 116 to 101 and level the series in the Western Conference. The New York Knicks beat the Philadelphia 76ers 97-92 to take a 3-1 lead in the Eastern Conference tie. That's your sports for now. George, thank you, George, again in about half an hour. Well, from sport to business, and we're heading to Singapore and speaking to our correspondent, Mariko Oi. Mariko, the boss of Tesla, the one and only Elon Musk, has made a surprise visit to China. What's he up to this time? Well, I don't know if you remember, but about a month, about a year ago, when I was talking to you back in the day, we were just literally waiting to find out what Elon Musk was up to by, you know, finding out who showed up in his hotel and so on. And this time it feels a bit of deja vu, you know, it's very much unannounced surprise visit, but we did just see a news flash saying that Tesla has partnered up with Baidu, the Chinese company, for mapping and navigation functions. That's according to Bloomberg News. Uh, but of course, uh, Mr. Musk believed to have been in China uh, in order to clear some introduce its advanced driving features in the country. So this partnership with Baidu might help that. But yesterday, uh, when he showed up unannounced, uh, he met uh, Chinese Premier Li Chen, uh, talked about uh, the foreign investment in China and so on. So yeah, it was very much unannounced, but getting things done, it seems. So how important is the deal with Baidu than, than Mr. Musk has signed or gotten into? Well, this is, of course, the, you know, assisted driving features. This is something that Mr. Musk has been really desperate to push, um, especially because EV sales in the United States have been falling. Tesla has had pretty horrendous uh, several months where sales have been falling, profits falling, and so on. And China, of course, being the world's biggest uh, car market, this is an important market for him to introduce this very high-tech uh, high tech cars. So this partnership could probably help that, but we don't know the details just yet. And very briefly, Marco, if you may, he postponed a trip to India. Somebody might not be pleased. Yes, uh, that was a lot of the reaction that I saw on social media when he uh, announced yesterday that he was in China, that, oh, you know, you were too busy to come to India. So, but I'm sure he has just postponed it. So I'm sure he'll pop up in India as well. Mariko Oi, thank you so very much. Our business correspondent in Singapore, you're listening to news here on the BBC World Service. A quick headline that we are also looking into is Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is due to reveal whether he will step down because of corruption against his wife. And the first of three trials of an alleged plot to overthrow the German government is about to begin in Stuttgart. This is news there on the BBC World Service. And that's where we leave the BBC World Service this morning. Good morning, it's 5.20 on Monday the 29th of April. And this is Charles Carroll welcoming you to BBC Radio 4. Coming up in just a moment, we'll have the shipping bulletin, followed at 5.30 by news briefing. First though, let's take a look ahead. Do boys talk about things like this? No, not, not over. We talk a lot about boys today, or talk at boys, but how often do we just listen? You just don't know what the hell a man even is in today's society. I'm Catherine Carr, and as part of a series of programmes across Radio 4 and 5 Live on boys and young men, I've been hearing from different boys about their hopes and fears. Maybe them, yeah. I'd rather be brought up in a different generation. About the boys, this Monday to Friday at 1.45 on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. And now here's Helen Willits. Good morning. Charles, thank you and good morning. Yes, it's time for the shipping forecast. It was issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency at 0505 today, Monday the 29th of April 2024. Now there are warnings of gales in Viking, North Azira, Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea, Bailey, Fair Isle, Faroes and South East Iceland. The general synopsis at midnight. Low, Fair Isle, 994, expected Bailey, 1,000.